Fun time. Welcome to the podcast, people, Martin Devlin, Lachlan War, iOS, it's only sport. The highlights of our program today, which aired 1 to 4 live on the platform. Warriors heavy today, we were at the presser out at Go Media Mount Smart Stadium this morning. Uh, Jazz Tavanga spoke, Bunty R4, Andrew Webster, coach, before we had to uh, dine a dash and leave. How uh, fascinating it was. You could really feel it from the players. Uh, you know, all the questions, obviously, to start with. Well, you know, how, how's the team feeling? Low on confidence, all of this. All of the players and the coach said the same thing. Yeah, we are down. We are low. But they've got to recover, and they've got to recover quickly because, you know, this isn't an excuse league, and it's not a sympathetic league. It's a winning league. And out of all the opponents that you want right now, after four losses on the trot with the injuries, is this happens to be the Penrith Panthers. You're going to get a fair bit from that presser today, and we'll kick it all off with Andrew Webster. Also on the program, Michael Hendry. What a great story this is. Michael won a tournament in Japan on the weekend for the players, by the players it was. Uh, but the most significant thing is it's almost a year ago to the day since he was diagnosed with leukemia. So he's bounced back from that. He can explain exactly where he is, his health is, and everything else. But just the change in headspace. What does it mean to him now when he's standing there on the tee thinking, yeah, I've got a golf tournament to play. And then he wins it. Great story indeed. The English Premier League pretty much decided to, well, it is decided today. Man City aren't going to bottle it against West Ham, or are they? Miles Davis, lifelong West Ham fan, talking about that today. And the backflip that Nadia Comaneci would have been proud of. Uh, Google that, millennials. Uh, Delhi Cherry Evans did a similar one. David Fafita. I've signed for the... Oh, or have I? Oh, no. I actually want to spend my future now with the Gold Coast Titans. I've always loved the Titans. I believe that we can go on from here. And I've... That, that, yeah. How come? Why? Brad will kick that off for us. We begin the show. Tablets in hand, gather my flock. It is time for a sermon. Righto. Where are we at with our warriors then? Let's go to the mountaintop. We live in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots. The warriors are in a rut. Yes, we all know that. Low on self-confidence, struggling, four losses in a row. Yes, we all know that. For Coach Andrew Webster, this right now is probably the biggest lesson in what coaching in the NRL is actually about. Because for the most part, it's not a success job. It's more of an, an attritional job. It's a job that, for the most part, is not about winning. There's a few coaches who succeed, but even those guys have plenty of ups and downs in their careers. Who are the best coaches in the NRL right now? You'd say Bellamy, Cleary, Bennett, Trent Robinson, those names. All have gone through their trials and tribulations. Ricky Stewart, add him to it. For every success, there's more than a few failures. So this is just the first big test of probably many for Andrew Webster. As I said, the team's in the trough. Certainly the lowest ebb that he's faced since taking over last year. It's not just the injuries. It's also a dramatic loss of form, which means the players are down on confidence. And we were told this at the press conference by Bunty Afo, by Jazz Tavanga, by the coach himself, which means the players second-guess themselves and start second-guessing each other. It's a knock-on effect. Losing is contagious both on and off the field. So, so how do the Warriors escape this noose? Because that's what it feels like right now. This is just me, of course, looking from the outside in. Many of the players have been there before. Heck, it was only two years ago that the club had one of its worst ever seasons with just six wins. Let's not forget that. And most of those players are still with the club. Now, this is a different Warriors side. We know that. We saw that last year. It's completely different. But now they need to prove that. They have to prove that. I think one positive from the loss to the Roosters on the weekend was in the last 65 minutes, the score didn't blow out. Yes, the Roosters took their foot off the pedal, but two years ago, that could have easily been 50 or 60 points and probably would have been. So things have changed. But again, this isn't a talking league. It's, it's not an excuse league. It's not a sympathetic league. It's a winning league. The only thing that counts in this comp is wins. And the Warriors need 10 or 11 of those from now till season's end just to make the finals. Which means it's got to start with Penrith on the weekend. <laughs> Penrith... The defending premiers, the back-to-back-to-back to back to back champs. But a win has got to be found somehow, somewhere, before the games start running out. It's a simple recipe in this league, isn't it? Just win, baby. Unfortunately, with Penrith, that's probably more hope than reality. Devlin. What do you want? We want information. Information. 
You won't get it. The platform. Sports news headlines are... Uh, we'll start off with some NRL. Uh, in a stunning backflip, Gold Coast forward David Fafida has turned his back on the Sydney Roosters and taken up his two-year option to stay at the Titans. Now, last week, Fafida had until something like Thursday, at some point on Thursday, to trigger this clause that would allow him to extend his stay at the club. And he signed a four-year deal, supposedly, with the Roosters. He's backflipped today. The news has come out really, really strange. Uh, statements of both the Roosters and the Titans' websites. Uh, the Roosters say that they have withdrawn their offer um, despite his management making the initial approach to the club and for Fafita personally informing the Sydney Roosters chairman and head coach of his intent to join the club last week. Fafita has since expressed doubt about his decision. Consequently, the club has elected to withdraw its offer with the view that it is in the Roosters' best interests. Uh, I would believe that more so than what the Titans have said. They haven't exactly said anything else, but they've just said that for feeders, changes. Oh, mind. commitment to the club, mate. Always believed in the Titans. I think that they were a premiership winning side, um, a family compassionate clause. What would uh, what would actually be the reason to prompt money, him to... Money, money, money. But if he doesn't trigger the clause and stays for another two years and the contract remains intact, he doesn't get more money. Oh, he doesn't? <laughs> oh, he doesn't. Because it's the oh, contract, right? He already yeah. knows what he's going to get. There's not a big bucket of money that he trips over well, on the way it's... Now, this is yeah. the thing that makes oh. NRL contract dealings a little bit dodgy, is the whole third-party agreement. There agreements. you go. Because so there's, no, there's no limit on how okay. much you can get from let's third just, parties. Let's just, let's just look at this sensibly and logically. I'm going over there to sign a new contract, which probably meant I was getting a little bit more money than I was here to go over there, right? Mm. Then at the very last minute after I've agreed to that, I do a big back with the DCE, the Delhi Cherry Evans, the Nadia Comaneci for our older listeners... And I come back over here and I stay for the same money that I was on before I went over there for more money and I've come back for the same money. Or, or, there's a hell of a big incentive put in front of it. You choose. Yeah, okay. I don't think yeah, that's, that's not being cynical, that's being real is what mm. that is. Um... Blues fullback Zahn Sullivan has a meniscus tear in his left knee. Very bad news yeah, not, for Zahn. Not good. We've spoken to him this and year. I like that guy. He's been playing well too. He has been playing well. He's a good player. He's a good fullback. Uh, it's an injury that requires surgery. Uh, this after leaving the field in last weekend's victory over the Hurricanes. The extent of the injury will be known when Sullivan has surgery uh, tomorrow. But uh, there is an expectation he'll be out of rugby for a minimum of one month. I would think it'd be long. If you're having your meniscus operated on, that's more than a month, sure. I was looking at either him or Ruben Love being bolters for the All Blacks. Maybe not at, at the beginning of the year, but certainly at the end of the year if they keep their form up. Mm. Both players. Uh, Premier League this morning, Tottenham up against Man City. Yeah. Uh, Man City winning 2-0. Uh, the first goal was a pretty standard, easy goal on the end. Almost walked it into the back of the net. Second goal was a penalty. Both scored by Erling Haaland. What it means in terms of the table with one week left in the Premier League. Man City played 37. Arsenal played 37. City have 88 points, Arsenal 86. It's going to come down to the very last day of the season, the Premier League title race. City have West Ham. Is that at home? Yeah. It is at home. Yeah. Arsenal have Everton at home. You'd think they're both gimme games, wouldn't you? Um, I could. I would have much more faith in Arsenal bottling it than City in terms of the result on the final day. Uh, and Everton did get a win over us, so they're not an easy beat. Mm. Then again, West Ham I don't think are an easy beat either. Um, actually, no, that's not true. That kind of Boyce's last match. Now, nah, Man City got this wrapped up. And it was wrapped up when the Tottenham Ford Son was one-on-one -on -one in the 85th minute. It was 1-0 to City at that time. That one chance. Great, I think it was more more so a better save by the goalkeeper than it was a bad effort from Son. We'll talk to Miles about that in about 20 minutes. But that one single chance. It's amazing, isn't it, in a season of 38 games that it can quite often come down to just single moments. That particular moment. Yeah. All Arsenal fans would have been looking, ah, oh, you're joking, he missed it. Now, the result confirms that Aston Villa are in the uh, Champions League, excuse me, for next season. So Aston Villa at the moment on 68, Tottenham on 63, one game to go, the most Tottenham can get is 66. So Villa in the Champions League, woo -hoo, good stuff. Oh, and the Villa. Oh, and the Villa. Uh, Ange Postacoglu had a couple of interesting things to say following the defeat this morning, saying that the foundations at Tottenham are really fragile. It's inside the club, outside the club, outside, inside, everywhere. It's been an interesting exercise. It's just my observations. Mate. He always likes to throw a mate in there, doesn't he? Uh, Rory McIlroy has filed for divorce from his wife of seven years. Erica Stoll is her name. After claiming their marriage is broken. This comes less than a week after he won the Wells Fargo Championship, claiming 
3.6 million US dollars, which is just under 6 million New Zealand dollars, taking his career earnings on the PGA Tour to 143 million over the past 15 years. Uh, the NBA playoffs continue today. There's a game on right now. It is the Indiana Pacers up against the New York Knicks. It's in New York, and the Knicks are cruising 69 54. I thought once the Pacers won game four that they would win the series. The Knicks have a ton of injuries, a couple of key defensive players, including OG Ananobi. But they're up by 15 at halftime here. Maybe the Knicks will actually end up winning the series. I'll get just absolutely trounced by the Celtics in the conference finals. Anyway, uh, later today at 2.30, the Denver Nuggets up against the Minnesota Timberwolves. The Nuggets are at home, but the home team hasn't won a game in this series. Not yet. Out of the first four games, the road team has won every single time. Really odd. Uh, we'll keep you updated on those two scores. And for the time being, Martin, that's what's making news. Devlin. The platform. First up on the show, Brad Walter. Brad, Brad's going to join us in an hour for a good chat about the Warriors. Uh, but it's a little word on the Fafita thing, because this is a hell of a shock, Brad. Uh, he has reneged on the deal with the Roosters, right? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? So there's a, there's a cooling-off period um, after players um, sign contracts with new clubs. Uh, there's a cooling-off period. Um, and, you know, Fafita only uh, signed last week. He... he he spoke. He actually personally rang Nick Politis, uh, the Roosters chairman, and uh, and told Nick that he was coming to the club. Uh, spoke to him in Greek, actually, uh, uh, or, or spoke a few words of, of Greek uh, with Nick and was t- told him how excited he was to be coming to the club. But um, there's a cooling off period um, to allow, I suppose, players to, you know, to, to consider whether whether the deal that they've signed is is one that they actually want to go through with and. David Vita had a player option in his contract and uh, that expired last Thursday and that's why the pressure was on David Fafita to make a decision on whether he wanted to stay at the Titans or whether he wanted to go somewhere else. He uh, explored his, he, his options. He, his head was turned, I suppose, by the uh, opportunities at the Panthers and the Roosters in particular. Um, but after the weekend, and he did have a cracking game for the Titans and they, they had a win um, as well uh, against the Cowboys um, and he was, uh, he was player of the match. He's obviously... Um, He's changed his mind, decided he wants to stay. He's taken up the player option and he's, uh, and, and the Roosters said they've withdrawn their offer and the Titans have announced that uh, he's, he's re-signed for, for another further two years, taking up that player option. So that's a massive backflip. It's huge news. It's caught everyone by surprise. It's just, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's incredible, to be honest. Um, um, and people were wondering, though, how were the Roosters going to fit him in? Not necessarily salary cap wise, but sombrero, because mate. Of, it's a sombrero, you know. They have special rules for the Roosters, mate. Yeah, you know that. Well, no, but I mean, just because of players like Angus Crichton, you know, like and the impact that that was going to have, and Angus Crichton was caught by surprise and wondering about his future, and uh, you know, other clubs have, have, have come in, uh, expressed interest now in Angus Crichton. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens now, because obviously the Roosters, what they, you know, what they can do and what they probably should have done was. Um, uh, re-sign Angus Crichton. He's playing. He's in. He's back to his best form. So, um, but yeah, it's a. It's a. It's a, a stunning turn of events, and, uh, and 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 something that no one. I don't think anyone saw coming. So, uh, huge news. Um, huge news for the Titans. Huge news uh, for the Roosters, and, and and massive news for for the NRL. No doubt, it's going to be a, going to be a, a big talking point. People will be talking now, uh, asking questions now. I suppose about the. The, the cooling off period and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. So, um, but uh, yeah, certainly, certainly, certainly a big talking point And uh, I said something that nobody, nobody saw coming. Oh my goodness me! The platform. I mean, I think this is endemic now, people. Uh, you know, I think that uh, the. NRL contracts are just a joke, aren't they? Um, This is the tail absolutely wagging the dog. There is no personal responsibility. Players get out of contracts for whatever reasons that they want. The compassion clause is an absolute farce. It's a joke. It is a let-off clause is what it is. And for a guy to commit to sign to say yes and then to turn around for whatever reason, whether he's been offered more money or whatever, but it just seems that there is just way too much power now in these players' hands. And if you've signed a deal and you've committed to something, it's like you sign a mortgage, it's like, like you sign anything. You sign a contract. That's your word. That's more than a handshake. It's actually a legal binding document. That's what it should be. I'd be absolutely gutted if I was the Roosters. But then again, on the flip side of that argument, if the guy doesn't want to play for you, well, what's he going to do? He's going to be a sulk, isn't he? You're going to come along, he's going to sulk. And you've just spent all of that money for four years to get a sulk. You don't want to be there. Warriors press it then today. First up, Coach Andrew Webster. Now, Andrew is in his second season with the Warriors, had a fantastic season last year. But 
The wheels haven't fallen off, but the car is a bit clunky and a bit wobbly at the moment. How does he resurrect that? How much does it come down to him? What does he have to do? What does he have to say? How does he get his players back up? And and also in his mind, what exactly is it that has been going wrong? Andrew Webster at the present. Last year was such a fantastic year. Yeah. And I remember asking you then about, you know, uh, whether you thought you were a better coach then, how much you'd learned and everything like that. How much are you learning right now and is this the toughest time of all? Yeah, it's the, the toughest time. Confidence is low. We're not playing the way we want to. I'm not hiding behind it, like, um, but you know, coming with the tough times is the excitement of you know how much you learn. You want to be part of these moments in a way. Like we'd rather have won the last four in a row and we're flying on top of the table. But at the same stage, like you find out about everyone now, and um, yeah, we. I, I love this group. I love the way they're they're attacking it. We're we're definitely down on confidence, but we've got to find it. And when we find it, we'll, we'll, we'll be really confident that we'll. We'll win games. We just had Jazz and Bunky come in. They said exactly the same thing. They said, know. yeah, low on confidence and things. So yep. what is your role here? How do you how do you inspire that in your players? Yeah, there's two things. Like, one, um, got, to, got to keep reminding ourselves what the standards are. And we've got to find the standard and, and raise the bar. Um, and once we find the standard and we're back to where we were, because it's not a new standard. It's just reminding ourselves of where our standards were. And once we find that, we'll get confidence again. Um, and it's also... How to instill it in them is like to celebrate when we, when we get it right. Um, show them how they, in the past, how they've done it really well. Um, five weeks ago, like um, our defence was really good. We we're really proud of where we we're at. But just can't take it for granted. You can lose it very quick. A week in rugby league is a long time, and um, yeah, well, I think we can get that confidence back by by getting back to the stands where we're at, and also show them how it looks. Like show them how they've done it really well in the past. Do you question yourself at any time like this? I, I question. Am I consistent? Am I doing the right thing? I, I do that if we win or lose. You know what I mean? Um, you have to, because you don't get better if you don't question the way you're doing things. Um, the thing is, if we if we were like what we were doing defensively, if we if we needed to change everything, there'd be something wrong by the way we go about it. We need to change the way we execute it. So what we want to do and how we want to do it, we're completely happy about it. Every player, every coach, and myself. So. I reflect, are we happy with the way we want to do things? Yes. Are we doing it? No. So we've got to, I've got to get creative. I've got to instill the confidence. I've got to get excited. Uh, make these guys excited about doing it again. Well, there's Andrew Webster. We've got a couple more quotes to come from him. That was the end of my questions. What normally happens is you ask two or three questions and obviously you back off, let somebody else ask the questions. Um, just your first impressions, Lachlan, of him at that presser. Uh, he, he wasn't grim. He was serious-faced. Um, uh, certainly not as happy and as bouncy as I've seen him in the past. But that's what you'd expect with a team that has lost four in a row. And, you know, the players were a bit like that as well. I worry when they all admit that they're down on confidence because, you know, you keep saying that to yourself and it becomes very real, doesn't it? They've just got to find it from somewhere. And I started the show by saying, well, you know, you're up against Penrith for God's sake, you know. I mean, having said that, a win against Penrith, what would that do? I mean, they'd just it completely, it'd do the David Fafita. It'd be a backflip. It'd flip the season right on its head, wouldn't it? Andrew Webster, uh, this question was about tough conversations with the players because both Jazz Tavanga and Bunty Afor, when they came and said that there had been tough conversations. So exactly what are those? Yep, definitely. I mean, every loss last year, I still thought we, like, effort was unbelievable. We just, we didn't know what we are doing. Um, I just felt like the, the last couple of weeks, things have, things have dropped. Um, I think we're putting a lot of effort and over trying at some stage and then I just think we're putting our energy into the wrong things instead of putting our energy in what's most important. Um, I've said it for three weeks now, our tackling, our kick chase, those types of things, they're just, they're not where they were. And, um, can't take it for granted, we've got to get back to it. And to me, those are a couple of things that you can change. This is what I like to hear it today. These, these, these are really positive things. You can change your kick chase. You know, that's just effort, desire, commitment. That's all that is. You know, not missing tackles, these kind of things. And they do build confidence. So I, I like the practical aspect of that. Talk us through the changes at halves. Of course, these are enforced by the absence of Sean Johnson. And don't forget that Luke Metcalf is also injured. Both of those players, you know, the one-two punch that the Warriors could have had, don't happen. But then again, playing at a Penrith side without Nathan Cleary, we've got to acknowledge this. Everyone's got injuries. Uh, but this is Tamari Martin at seven and Charles Nicole Klukstar at six. I think 
if we try and complicate it um, this week and we don't have a running mentality, um, I think Chance would be great. I think he's a big body in the defensive line. Yeah, like we trust me, we're not going to come up with lots of fancy plays out this week, but um, we're, we're going to challenge the opposition. Um, and I don't mind saying that. Look, we're, we're going to play to our strengths this week, not, not to what Sean would like to do. It's going to be what Tamaiti, Chance and Tane like to do. Again, I like it. You see, you've got to forget about the guys that aren't there because they're not there. <laughs> so there's, yeah, no point thinking or talking about them is there. How did Chance react to himself being named to play six in the halves? Did he know about this at all? No, he didn't expect it. No, but he went, um, let's go. Knowing that's, you've got to, you've got to be here every day. It's his favourite. Um, when he gets excited about something, that's what he says. So he was pretty pumped. Um, I, yeah, I'm sure he'd love, rather play fullback, but he just does what the team needs and something different and train well today. So he's excited. Any regrets at all? Andrew Webster, this is at the press. If you've just joined us on the platform, myself and Lachlan, we're at the Warriors uh, just a couple of hours ago, as a matter of fact. It kicked off at about 11.15. Any regrets at all uh, about at halftime about uh, letting Sean come back as opposed to looking at that injury and keeping him in the dressing room, keeping him off the field? No, no. I mean, we didn't make the injury worse in the second half. I mean, how he was at half time is, is how he is now. So, I mean... The feedback was they strapped it, they felt it was safe, it wasn't in the tendon, in the attachment. Um, because if it was in the attachment, trust me, he wouldn't have gone back out. Um, so I trust the medical team. I looked at Sean, he was like, I want to do it. And then when it got to a point where I thought, this is it's not, it's not working, it's not fair anymore, um, let's get him out. Oh, so, um, yeah, I, I'm fine with that. Like, um, we take medical advice and I, I back them 100%. And, as a result of this, if he was out for the rest of the season with Torn Peck, then I reckon you could come at our medical team and myself because it'd be a dumb decision. But um, we, it was, it was no worse now than what it was at halftime. Again, if you've just joined us, uh, so Sean walked past us. Say, when I say Sean, God, I don't know him that well. Do I? Sean Johnson walked past us as we first arrived there, uh, and my only experience and knowledge of this kind of injury, a peck injury, I remember when I was in New Plymouth years and years and years ago, decades ago, and Mark Allen, Bull Allen, had the same kind of injury playing for Talanaki in the rugby. He was out for months, but that was ripped off the bone. So if it was anything like that, as Andrew Webster says there, no, he wouldn't have played. Uh, final bit of him at this particular time is just about the the punishment to Kerry, who gets fined, what, a couple of thousand bucks. Uh, really, does he even pay that? You know, it's like when the tennis players get fined. Oh, they get fined for descent, $40,000. Does it, is there somebody in an office somewhere who actually, well, hang on, hang on. Lockton he hasn't sent us his check yet. Novak hasn't sent us that forty thousand dollar check yet. And when that money right, where does that go? Does it go to a charity? Is there a special fund for fines for players? And uh, so Andrew Webster's reaction to to that, and he's got to be careful about this. But you know, I mean, a guy now misses games because of that. It's an illegal tackle. Uh, it's something that needs to be ridded from the game. We all thought it had been ridded from the game. It was very obvious when it happened. I'm not saying he goes in there with deliberate intent, but he certainly knew what he was doing when he was twisting the arm like that. So was the punishment appropriate? Yeah, I, I think they're scary. Um, I, I just don't ever like to get involved in the judiciary. Um, you just got to, you guys have got to ask yourself, like everyone's got to ask themselves, did, did that put it in a compromising position? Was Sean in pain? Sean was in pain from that tackle. From that, um, I feel like they think he was faking it or something like that. Um, but in hindsight, we all know he wasn't. Um, yeah, I at the end of the day, they, they think that it, was, it wasn't that dangerous and only deserves a fine. So I don't feel great about that. I don't feel great that one of our players has been hurt uh, as a result of it. But um, we play on, just move on. And like I said, the, the, judici- the judiciary are there to, to, co- to do those things. And I'm just here to coach the boys. Surely oh, you don't want to come back into the sport, though, do you? No, definitely. Oh, I don't want any chicken wings in the sport. I don't want any foul play in the sport. But what I'm getting at, OK, if you want to ask me, do I like chicken wings? No. Do I like... People attacking the legs, no. Do I like crush your tackles, head highs, eye gouging, pulling hair? <laughs> what else is there? Uh, Christmas hole. Yeah, that one, that's, that's not good. I don't, I don't want any of it. I don't want any of it, but what I'm saying is they're the ones who've got to, on a daily, a weekly basis, judge whether that one particular one was bad and if he's got suspended. And I just don't want to dive into, into that. I just would love every player protected and safe. And then they've got to come down hard on it. Premier League, Manchester City, about to create history. 
Since the Premier League began in 92-93, no side has won four in a row. No side has won six out of seven. It's an incredible run for Manchester City. And this is a team that most people who follow the league say, oh, yeah, they're not having a great year. They're not having a great year. The last 35 games, well, 34 of those have either won or drawn. They haven't lost in the Premier League since December the 6th, since getting knocked out of Europe by Real Madrid. And they didn't lose either tie. They got knocked out on penalties. They've had five Premier League matches. Well, they've won all five scoring 21 goals and conceding one. And away at Tottenham today, 2-0. In the end, it was comfy, and they just have to take care of business at home against West Ham, and it is all theirs. Miles Davis, blah, 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 blah. All about that. Was this the moment that the Premiership went to, or the Premier League, rather, went to Man City? Reminded me of Michael Thomas. Remember that? Arsenal, Liverpool, 89, when he was through on goal, last kick of the season. Well, they, they won, though. Yeah, that's apart from that. Either. But it was just... It was yeah, just so apart from the fact that he actually scored and won the title for them up at Anfield in 1989. Yeah, no, no. So I'm not quite sure what you mean. Okay, well, it was just... Do what you know I, what, really what I mean? First... What I mean? It was, it was a one-on-one, and with the whole of the season almost on the line, it's just a goalkeeper and a striker. What happens? Well, Thomas scored... Yeah, but the goalkeeper scored. The goalkeeper saved in this one, and Thomas scored. Yeah, <laughs> Ayan Robin anyway, against Casillas, by, World Cup final, one. 2010. I mean, I'm just, you know, same yeah. thing. No, but I do when understand. I, when yeah. I, uh, yeah, but when, when, when that happened, when that happened, my, uh, I, I thought, well, bang goes the, the opportunity of, you know, for Arsenal to win the title. But, but even more important than that, I'd put a little bet on three corners each, Haaland and Son both to score. So I was oh. up out of my chair going, get in, my little Korean friend. Yes. And then I abused him, abused him afterwards. It, it, it's, it's amazing how they managed. I mean, that really, and it was a great save as well. It wasn't as if Son missed it or hit it poorly. The guy stuck out his right leg, you know, at full stretch. To, to get a touch on that and save it. So it's a phenomenal save. But you look at that and City then go on and they get the penalty and they go on and, and comfortably win in the end. But you look at now, Arsenal uh, have got one game left, City have got one game left, but City have got the upper hand because they've got two points more. A draw with Arsenal winning will give the title to Arsenal. But unfortunately... City are playing West Ham. They're playing your and I was just talking to yes. Lockie before. Lockie before, and they're up at the um, they're up there at the Etihad as well. They're at home, so I said to Lockie before, they're going to West Ham will ship six. That six, mate. <laughs> so there's absolutely no, <laughs> no chance, chance whatsoever. Right. I don't think the moist sire is going to rise from the dead and, and, and um, you know, create another miracle there. It's all over. It's uh, all over. Yeah, and look, I've, I've read a lot of traffic um, on social media today. Arsenal fans moaning and bitching. We're all bitching about the financial fair play regulations, which City will never get punished for and everything else. And Arsenal have won 15 out of the last 17. They've drawn one of those, one... Won what? Uh, uh, four, no, one fifteen. Drawn one and, and actually lost one out of the last seventeen games. I mean, that normally would win you a title, but you're up against a juggernaut here. I can feel, I can understand the frustration from the Arsenal fans, but they also lost at home to Aston Villa a couple of weeks ago in a really crucial game at home. That even if they got a point, at, oh, no, actually they would have had to win that game. But look, there. This is what a season is, mate. It comes down to margins, doesn't it? And Man City, over the last seven years, this is going to be the sixth time they get it right. I mean, you know. You can't deny yeah, that. Exactly. But you, you look at their bench, and it's better than the starting lineup there you of, go. of most of the top yeah, six yeah, sides. That's it. that's it's trick, absolutely mate. ridiculous. Yeah. And, <clears> and, and one thing I've noticed today you know, that, that the city group, you know, that own clubs all over the world, I didn't realise that they own Girona in Spain who are at the moment second in in, in uh, La Liga. And I was thinking, what a great thing for a little club like Girona, you know, to get Champions League football. No, and then I no, realized, that's right, yeah, yeah, I found yeah. out that I had no idea that they're owned by the bloody city group. So that's why they're up there, because all the money's come into it. Um, you need a little bit more than money. You can you can plow loads of money. And I mean, West Ham spent half a billion dollars, and we're still crap. But... If you've got it, you've certainly got a massive advantage over everyone else. Hey, well, you should be getting your accreditation through in the next day or so so you can go and represent us platform at the Phoenix on Saturday night. They reckon it's going to be 30,000. It might even be sold out. Biggest football fixture in Wellington since the Bahrain game and obviously then, you know, the club games that followed since then. Uh, is there, is there, a, is there a, a, no pun intended, a fever pitch happening in Wellington? I can imagine that the city would be getting bulk behind this, wouldn't it? 
Yeah, oh, very much so. You know what New Zealanders are like, mate. Kiwi fans are, are real bandwagon jumpers. You get the loyal core, and then you get the bam. And fair enough, too. Uh, you know, why not jump on the bandwagon? Why not? It's good It's good for the club. It's good for the sport. Get more and more people interested. Yeah, exactly. I don't mind. To know no. what, the, what, the, what the viewerships, I've got no problem with what the viewerships like. Um, town is, yeah, is, is fizzing. And I, I, I would expect a sellout. I think there's still going to be people who haven't worked it out and will be turning up, you know, walking up on the day hoping to get in and I think they're going to be disappointed. Um, I just hope that your moody you know, request for accreditation yep, yep. isn't one of your usual efforts and I get left standing outside the stadium. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. The Tight Five. Five separate sporting uh, topics, roughly a minute or so on each. And when the bell reminds us, on we go to the next topic. Manchester City have won the Premier League. Is it that cut and dried now? Is there even any point talking about it? Is there any chance that West Ham can do a number on Man City this weekend and Arsenal can sneak it? The Warriors presser. What did you learn earlier today, Lachlan, about the Warriors after listening to Jazz Tavanga, Bunty R4, and then coach Andrew Webster? NBA basketball. God damn you, Sky Sport. You just don't give a stuff about us, the customers, do you? And I say this most weeks, and you don't. The NBA finals are on at the moment, and you've got women's NBA on. Uh, the, playoffs, sorry, not the finals, Lachlan. Uh, this isn't anything. Jesus it's man. nothing to do with that. It's about the quality and the level and the importance of the sport that is being played at the moment. You, you get this. Why are you choosing not to play it? Why are you giving us a WNBA game on at the moment of zero consequence to anything? <sighs> at the same time, Nick's a dick in the paces, not that you'd know about it. Half past two today, game five. Are they, what, are you covering that, are you? You're covering the Timberwolves versus the Nuggets or you've got another NBA women's game on, have you? Why don't you just make it women's sport, Sky Sport? How about that? Why don't you just actually change your business to just women's sport? See how many subscribers you have left by next week when you do that. This is what frustrates the hell out of me about Sky Sport. Over 90% of the people that subscribe are men. And quite a lot of them, like about 85% of those, are men who are over 40 years old. How about doing some qualitative research into what we want? Because we're your customers. Oh, no. Hell no. If it's not diverse, inclusive or whatever, it just doesn't, doesn't rate, doesn't, doesn't wash over there anymore, does it? A loose forward trio of Dalton Papali'i, Adi Savia, Hoskins Tutu. Is that better than Frizzell, Adi and Kane? Because that's who we had last year. Uh, David Fafita in the backflip. Jake Paul and Mike Tyson. God, we have to talk about that. Let's start with the Premier League. Tottenham Hotspur played hang on, is all they did today. They they just hung on. You know, Man City had a couple of chances in that first half. I watched this game. Uh, Spurs never really in it. Maybe one on the break. City got a goal. Uh, they had two or three really good chances. Keeper saved. It was 1-0 up until the 85th minute. Uh, um, Son one-on-one after a defensive lapse. Brilliant save from, was it Arteta? Ar- Ar- Ortega. Ortega, mm. uh, the Man City keeper. And this is a machine of a team, is what it is. Uh, you know, since they got knocked out of the Champions League by Real Madrid, and they didn't lose, they hadn't, they, they didn't lose a single game in the Champions League this year. They won every single one of their group games. They won both of their round of 16 games, both of their round of eight games. The semi-final, of course, they drew three or drew one or went out on penalties. Since then, they've had six games in the Premier League. They've won five out of five. They've scored 21 goals. They've conceded one. And now they play West Ham at home. Is the title gone? It's over, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's absolutely gone. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if, I, if I was a betting agency, I wouldn't even take a bet on this. Look, Miles uh, is right. West Ham are going to go up there and ship a hat full of goals. Well, West Ham can... This is me being very half-glass full in favour of Arsenal. Uh, West Ham can be a niggly side to... Uh, to break down in a way they play with this nine, even ten-man defensive block deep in their own half a lot of the time. Um, but, you know, I, rem- I remember Liverpool playing them a couple of weeks ago and we just couldn't really get anything through them, but we were awful. And then when West Ham played Chelsea, who, whose form's picked up lately, they got just ripped apart. Mm-hmm. Chelsea would put this long, lobbed ball in 
<laughs> one ball and West Ham are just broken up. So, no, they're not going to throw too many punches. I do, I'll tell you one thing quickly. It's a real shame because half of me would obviously have loved to have seen Arsenal win it because it's someone different than Man City and this league is, is fast becoming um, another Liga Ugh in France or Liga uh, 1 if you want to say the English version of it, uh, or Bundesliga, which is not really that anymore because we've just seen Bayer Levy. Yeah, but Bayern Munich had won it 11 times Yeah, and Bayern Munich are probably going to win the next five after That's this right, year anyway. Yeah. This is an, an off year for Bayern Munich. But the, the Premier League's becoming this, and it's becoming this because what doesn't help is the other rich clubs, Chelsea and Man United, have been appalling the last couple of years. So as much as City have been great, which is where there's some truth in what Pep said yesterday, the other big rich clubs have been shite. Uh -huh. Absolute yeah, shite. That's right. Yep. Um, so it's a shame that Arsenal can't be a team to knock them off. Um, at the same time, I've seen some stuff from people on Twitter or people I follow on Instagram, and obviously they're going to be upset. I don't know what it's like because my Liverpool went through this a couple of times, losing out to City by one or two points when we got 90 or more and sitting there going, well, geez, all the money they have, all the resources, and we were so close. I, I think it's silly for anyone to sit there and say, any Arsenal fan, that Spurs were either going to try and help you guys out because oh, they're your biggest it, rivals, but also, it, secondly, yeah. they were good enough to actually no, take points no, off City. Not. They've been in seriously poor yeah, form it, late. Yeah. Um, so Man City have done this in a canter. Yeah. Uh, there's 34 out of the last 35 games. And this is a, they, they, an they, off they've game. They've either won or they've drawn. And this is... Yeah, uh, a, a side, oh, sorry, an off-season, excuse side, me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a striker in Haaland who's having an average season, he's got 27 Premier League goals. Okay. Six more than the next two. Uh, the Warriors presser, what did you learn? And we're going to um, revisit because we'll play the the stand-up with Jazz Tavanga in about an hour from now. What did you learn from the two players, our four, Tavanga and the coach, Andrew Webster today? Um, i tell you one thing. Tavanga, he was the first one to speak. He just looked deflated. Didn't he just? The first question he answered was a great answer. We are, uh, the question was along the lines of how, how's the team feeling? How have you guys been the last couple of days? He just said, yeah... I don't feel good. No, <laughs> down on self-confidence, yeah. Mm. Said it in a really sombre tone, and I just thought, jeez. Like, one thing I would have done if I was a player or coach, I'm not saying they are doing anything wrong, but I just would have done all I can to make it seem like, you know, we're working hard, we're doing our thing here, and we've got confidence we can get back on track, and he just looked deflated. That's what the, the message I got loud and clear from all three of them was exactly the same. They all said that as well, and I don't know whether that's been spoken about, that they say, well, let's be open and honest, let's talk about the fact we've got no self-confidence, but you've got to buy it. If you don't have it, you've got to fake it. You've got to get it from somewhere. Yeah. Because if I'm Penrith and I'm, I'm going, we're dicking these. But I, I, I think... Go I've harder than for 10 minutes and they'll break. That's yeah, what I'm Yeah, exactly. The great thing about Andrew Webster, and, and he's actually a real treat to be around, and there's one point where he said... You, know, you guys are going to find this boring, but and he spoke for about two minutes. Mate, oh, I, I was, wasn't bored. I was, I was locked in. I was thoroughly enjoying it. Me and Lachlan were standing this close. We we're only yeah. a couple of feet away from that. Oh, half a metre. And that. you know, and I'm just absolutely zeroed in on his eyes yeah. and his facial expression, and I want to know every single sinew of that face and and how, and and every muscle movement just to. And he's real, man. Mm. He's absolutely real. And he's real. honest. He, he knows how the comp works. He's, he's sitting there saying, look, we're not going to sugarcoat things. We know that we've been poor. But we also know that, as you've said many times for the show, and he sort of said this, but in a bit more detail, that, look, a win over Penrith, like, we know, like that does change a few things. And he sort of said, someone asked him uh, something along the lines of, uh, how long until you can get back to your best? He said, it only takes one game. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I think Warriors fans should should be encouraged by is he's saying we're doing the right things we're not executing it we've got the right idea we don't have an issue with what we're trying to do it's just the fact that we're just not executing it plus he said a thing along that he said it's muscle memory and what he was saying it's not just you know in the physicality of what you do but he said you know we've got to remember how good we were and that we are mm. that good it's not like we're no longer any and, good and the feeling he said yeah, the, the, the feeling, feeling that generates get that there's that, a muscle yeah, memory get in that, that back yeah. for Fita, how surprised are you by this my initial reaction was, wow, did he really? And then the more I think about it, the more I think, no, look, I just don't trust this guy. There's something about him. He's just, it's not that he's flaky. It's just that I don't trust him commitment-wise for Fita. Well, did he sign a contract with the Roosters? He obviously told them yes. No, no, but did he sign a contract? Well, those rumoured, those did words... Did he sign a contract? I don't know, I don't care. Those words wouldn't have come out unless he'd said yes. The club... Yeah, he's, you know, he's admitted it. He said yes. He, he's spoken to the chairman. He spoke to the head coach. He's he, spoken he Greek said to yes. the, he spoken Greek to the owner, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, I know. The owner who's part... Uh, the chairman, uh, yeah, Nick Politis, who so must he, be part Greek. He's committed to it, and then he... Here's the thing... That, look... This did is the, Ruben Wiki sign no, no, for the Warriors? This is, no, 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 yes, because no, no. what he did is he signed on a napkin at the airport, remember, and the employment court threw it out. He signed on a serviette at the airport when Ian Robson was the CEO to move. This was years before he came back to the Warriors. Said yes, then balked, then decided no. 
and stayed with the Raiders. Fine. And Look, that, sorry, if, the, if he hasn't signed on the dotted line of a contract, it doesn't mean anything. This is how it goes. Like, this could be quite an insular thing in New Zealand or Australia if we get to uh, within our own heads. In the UK, in America, in every country around the world, unless the, the, the pen has been put to paper. Look, so many football transfers, for example, that I'm sure your club, my club have been involved in that have nearly happened, but a guy didn't sign the contract and, oh, things changed and he backed out. You can't cry about it because, sorry, yeah, th- this is what happened with Greg Inglis and the Broncos in 2011, 2010. Billy Cherry the, Yeah, well, I, I remember the Inglis one really well because it was my club where he had told the Broncos, I'm coming, don't worry, I'm coming. And the Broncos sat there and went, oh, sweet, we've got it. Got GI. And then Russell Crowe uh-huh. snuck in, there you go. Had, a, had a meeting with yeah. him, said, come to South. You, you, so, you'll totally reshape the club. Look, you can cry, like if you're a Roosters fan or you're sitting there saying, oh, stuff David Fafita, what a dickhead. Excuse my French. Sorry, if he didn't sign the contract, and and players are actually given this as uh, Brad Walter called it. What is it? Uh, he gave it a something period. What did he call it? Uh, grace uh, period. Let's just call a, it a let's, grace period. Let's make an excuse to, no, not to do a what war, we a promised. War, a warm down period. If, uh, look, if they've given that and that's kosher in the NRL with these situations, I mean, no, I'm I, sorry, I go back this, to what this, I said earlier, mate. I just think these contracts are a joke. You know, you're no, but a man, he hasn't. No, made, no, 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 but he hasn't signed one. You've made a commitment. You said yes. You can't make an argument about it. He hasn't signed. No, but he hasn't signed anything. Well, what kind of person are you? Well, he's someone who made a choice, maybe thought about it a bit more and went, you know what, no, I want to stay with the Titans. He didn't want to stay with the Titans. He's been offered twice as much well, sure, salary to sure. stay you with can the sit Titans. There, look, now you can sit there and say that, but, you know, you can well, debate. what other reason? Well, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm the same as you. I think it's the same reason. But, look, you got to look at the BFX. I would have him now, mate. Hey, oh, fine. I wouldn't he's try. not coming here. I would, no, but I would never him now, mate. I think you're a flake dude. What do you dude. mean now? He was never coming to the yeah, Warriors. Come, we don't want you the Warriors, mate. Yeah, I'm sure he wants to come play in no, Penrose. No, no, no. If, if, if he, Tell him to F off, mate. But, but David, we've got a great two-bedroom flat in Teatre too. What about that? No. He's, <sighs> okay. I think he's pretty happy in surface. Two quick topics to finish with. Jake Paul. He might be Iron Mike Tyson, but I'm titanium Jake Paul. Yeah, I've never heard anything so naff at a pre-fight press conference ever. What yeah. ponytailed marketing tight panted tosser told him to say that? What a stupid, dumb thing to say. Yeah, but look, why are we talking about this? No, nah, but yeah, but this is the thing. You, you, you're talking about a person who was a Disney Channel child, who then was a YouTuber and earned millions of dollars from being a YouTuber, which isn't a bloody job, and is now thinks he's a boxer. Walks around saying I'm the best boxer of this generation. You know, I got you know Twitter knockout of the year or something, and oh, thinking no, okay, he's right. he, he, he's the business when he's not. And then he makes this comment, and you're going to use logic to decide you know, or, or to work out whether we should actually be listening to these comments and taking them seriously and go, oh, it's, that's interesting. Let, let's run that in the news. No, the, the whole thing's a circus. Okay. We can't, you can't use logic to talk about a circus. Okay, so let's blame Ian Foster, let's blame Sam Kane. It's all their fault the All Blacks didn't win the World Cup. Here you go, Razor. Here's your loose Ford trio. <laughs> Dalton, Ardy, Satutu. Now, now, last year... Well, who's the six? Well, I, whoever, okay, that, that that's your loose forward trio. According to who? Well, I dare, well okay, I'm just putting that up there at the this moment. This is Martin Devlin's trio. This is my. This is so. Everything I've read from all the other all the other scribes, all the other commentators at the moment are saying Dalton's going to be seven. You know, Ardy will be six and Satuta will be eight. Or Ardy goes to to eight and who's your number six? Summer Penny. Summer Penny at eight. Okay. So I think Summer Penny's the six, and I think Satutu or he, Ardy are the eight. Is he is he an eighty minute player for an test match? Does he need well, to be? Well, in his defence, he's only played one test. Okay, so here we go. Is that loose forward trio, either combination, if you have Sam Penny in or Satutu in, better than Frizzell, Ardy and Kane? I would argue no. No, I'd agree with that. By the way, just quickly, uh, have you seen that apparently Razor's wanting to bring Shannon Frizzell back as well? It's Brilliant! Not, it's not just Richie, it's not Brilliant. just Sam White, Brilliant. it's Shannon Frizzell as well. And I can understand exactly why. You know, but this is the, this is the point I'm continuing to make. Where is this magic bucket of world-class players, the leading players in their positions in the mm. world that Razor's got to choose from? Mm. These same guys have been there for the last 12 losses in the last four seasons for the All Blacks and two drawn matches and all the unwanted records. Most of those same guys are sitting in front of him that he has to select. Is this Super Rugby season convinced you that all of a sudden those guys... Yeah, Anton Leonard Browns and so forth are all of a sudden the world-class player that we've always wanted them to be. Are they? Or is he picking the same players again that Ian Foster now, this supposedly is, now, failed? This, this is the thing. There's probably four or five uh, world-class players that played under Fozzie that aren't here in New Zealand anymore and that are either are going to be selected 
after a sabbatical. So Bowden Barrett, assuming he's healthy because he's got an injury. Um, and then the rest of them are guys who at least you and I agree on. Uh, not average, but they're fine. But they're not going to be these world beaters that we need them to be against Ireland, South Africa, France consistently. So you're either choosing out of a bucket load of guys who we've tried and hasn't really gone mm, well. That's right. Or fresh talent. That's it. Unproven fresh talent. Dalton Papali at seven. Away Ireland, away France, and away England at the end of the year. Yeah, you can actually kind of... I think you can compare this year really well to 2008. I tell you, I don't have a lot of confidence in that. No, a year after a um, a year after a disappointing World Cup, uh, same coaching setup, this is different, but you had a lot of key players go offshore. The difference then is, you know, we had a bunch of new All Blacks in the team, guys returning who had played a few years earlier, uh, and a whole lot of new caps. Like Rudy Wolf was picked, Boric was picked. I think Stephen Donald debuted that year. The difference then to now, what makes at least me as a fan very worried about this year, is back then we still had Richie McCall, we had Dan Carter, we had a guy, Kieran Reid, emerging. Jerome Kano came back into the team. Uh, we had a lot of... Uh, Mills Mulyaina was in the team. You know, Jericho Thugger, who was still playing really well, was there. Brad Thorne was in the team. Ma. Ali Williams. Ma. Ma. Conrad. Mm-hmm. That was when the yeah. combination started. Yeah. You're starting really. to talk about world-class players. So then. these are players who, at the time, when you... OK, we can kind of lean on these guys, or they turn into world beaters. Well, who do we have now? That's right. Who are our halves? Yeah. Who's our who's our captain? And can we even rely on it? Like, I mean, Scott Barrett, I, I want him to be the captain, but this is a dude who seems to be getting a lot of cards on the field over the last couple of years, reds and yellows. It's not nothing, not, nothing yeah. against Scott no, Barrett. I think so. he's a brilliant player. I totally agree. I totally agree. I just think we just got to... We're in the wilderness a bit. That's it. You know, you know, however good Razor is, and the coach can be the best coach in the world, does he have the cattle? That is the question. Michael Hendry, ladies and gentlemen, he's won 17 professional tournaments in his career. He's playing up in Japan at the moment. He's about to go, we learned in the interview, off to the British Open. He was invited there last year, but of course he couldn't go because he got diagnosed this time last year with leukaemia. So what a comeback to win a tournament on the weekend. It was a stable format. Uh, He went in on the final day, four points clear. He won by a point. He can explain all of this. But how has life changed in every possible way for him as he battles back against that illness? And he wins again. Here's Michael. Talk us through that the last couple of shots, mate. When you know you thought I can actually do this. What what was flooding through your body at that stage? Well, you get pretty um, engrossed in the process, really. Um, I knew obviously where I stood and what I needed to do, and I just made sure that I uh, I got it across the line basically. And it wasn't until uh, Monday morning I was travelling down from from Tokyo to Kyoto where we're playing uh, this week's event and uh, it wasn't until I was on the train sort of having a bit of alone time that I that I sort of realised what I'd done and that I'd actually achieved what I set out to do you know 12 months ago in a hospital bed which was get back out on tour and um, and win again and it was um, it was re- it was just yeah it was unbelievable it's really great. Uh, can I ask you some questions about this? And you know, please, if you don't want to answer them, just don't answer. But but where are you at? Are you absolutely clear now? I'm uh, not completely and utterly clear, but um, as things are tracking, the, I'm in complete remission. Um, leukemia is a funny one because I can still, even when you're in complete remission, identify uh, leukemic cells within the, within the marrow tests that they do. But as I'm told by my specialists if they were to take any random person off the street and give them a bone marrow biopsy and do the same testing um, that they do on me, uh, most likely they would find those cells in almost everyone because um, it's a situation where those cells pop up and the immune system deals with them. Um, It just so happens that that people that uh, get leukemia, for whatever reason, their immune system stops doing the job it's supposed to do and that and those types of cells start running the muck in your, within your uh, immune system so in all reality I'm doing as well as anyone else on the street but um, because I've got a history um, obviously we've got to, to monitor it carefully as we go forward how has it changed your golf have you you know just in terms of your, your, your strength your resilience on court you know your breathing all of that kind of stuff does it how much does it affect all of that uh, not at all, thankfully. Um, the, the chemotherapy is is very harsh on the uh, on the neurological system. So often, when you're taking chemotherapy, they'll run you through. It's almost like going through a sobriety test. But they'll um, you know test you for all sorts of different movement patterns and things like that to ensure that they're not damaging your your nervous system too much. So um, it can have an effect on the neurological system, um, which was a bit of a concern for me. 
Uh, but I pushed particularly hard through even periods of chemotherapy um, in the gym with my trainer and, um, and made sure that my fitness level was high. I felt that that was sort of one thing I could control in the journey through the chemotherapy process and, and trying to get myself back and ready because um, I'll be honest, after the first six and a half week stint that I stayed in hospital, I came out and I was 17 kilograms lighter and, Good Lord. and even walking up stairs at home was particularly difficult. Um, you know, I'd, have, I'd get to the top of the stairs at home and I'd have to stand at the top of the stairs for a couple of minutes and catch my breath and I just kind of thought to myself, look, if if I truly want to try and achieve the goals that I've reset myself, I've got to do something about it now. I can't wait until the chemotherapy process was completely over because the road back was going to be too long. So uh, I engaged a trainer early on in the piece, and in some days it was all I could do was to just get through the warm up um, before I was, you know, I didn't have the energy to continue. But um, we worked really hard during that period and uh, I'm convinced that was the one thing that allowed me to get back into golf quickly um, but also I'm, I'm pretty convinced it had a big effect on me on how I got through the treatment as well and I think it made it more effective um, so yeah I mean physically I'm again I feel like I'm almost better than I was beforehand just like my mental attitude I think my physical stuff is, is probably as good as it's ever been as well did you consider the possibility or think to yourself or talk to you, those closest to you and say, hey, look, you know, maybe I might just be, you know, I might be a, a, you know, going down to JK's and hitting a box of balls in the future. That might be my golfing career. I might not be able to play this. I might not be able to walk four days anymore, you know? I absolutely. I had that conversation with myself many times. Um, but very much so early on in the piece, once I kind of got my head around that, okay, I wasn't, you know, death wasn't imminent um, and that I probably would make it through the other side of this. I thought to myself, what do I want to do? And, um, you know, my first thought was my children and I wanted to make sure that um, obviously this disease is going to be hanging around and I wasn't going to die in the next little while, but potentially it was going to take me out sooner rather than later. And I, I wanted to make sure that whatever I did um, you know, they could look back and be proud of what their dad did, and um, it was basically how can I, how can I reframe this in a way that I can teach my children a lesson, a really valuable life life lesson that you know life will kick you in the guts, but how do you, how do you come out the other side of it is is the most important thing. So um, I kind of thought to myself, well, if I can. If I can do anything, it's, I can play golf. So let's get back out there and show the kids that, um, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in life, you can dig yourself out of a big hole and, um, and get back out there and do what you need to do and, and be a success. So, um, you know, it became about inspiring my children more than anything. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. That's our podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to listen to the entire show, one to four, Monday to Friday, download the Platform app and via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to whatever shows over however many weeks at your leisure, at your listening pleasure. Platform Plus. First thing to do, though, is download the Platform app. Devlin. Unbelievable. Incredible. The Platform.